you have been joining in for every single session this week or how many sessions you managed to catch, especially if you're, you're coming in for the first time today. Welcome, an extra special welcome to you guys. Um, inshallah, we'll get several opportunities to, to reminisce over the course of the next two hours, but I don't want to steal any more time because Alhamdulillah, we have Sheikh Saad Taslim, Sheikh Walid Basuni, and then Sheikh Wassam Sharif back to back to back. So we have not one, not two, but three amazing story time sessions to look forward to. So I won't take any more of your time and I'm going to pass it off to Sheikh Saad Taslim, who's been waiting patiently. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Sheikh Saad. How are you doing today? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm doing well, alhamdulillah. How are you? I'm great. I'm just disappointed we don't have enough time to, to sneak in any digs at you, but <laughs> inshallah, we'll be ready for a future session. <laughs> inshallah. Um, Looking forward to it. Looking forward to the story today of Asma bint Abi Bakr. And inshallah, we'll kick it right off, inshallah, and we'll interact with everybody in the chat. Welcome, everybody, as you're trickling in. And bismillah, Shaykh, I'll pass it off to you. <clears throat> bismillah. Uh, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone out there uh, on the internet. <laughs> um, so the story that I picked uh, is the story of the companion Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Uh, now, let me get into the why first of all. Um, let's talk about a general category. So the general category of uh, the companions. Uh, and then we'll get into Asma radiallahu anha, um, why I picked her in particular. Uh, now the companions, uh, I can speak about my journey through Islam. And um, as you know, I started my journey in Islam and I, as I tried to progress in my Islam, um, I you know, read and heard many stories. Uh, and alhamdulillah, all the stories that we have in Islam are, are amazing and they're great. Um, you know, probably the most important story is the story of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the seerah, the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and very closely tied to the seerah, uh, the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, is the, uh, are the lives of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, and one of the points that always stuck out to me was that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wasn't sent um, in a vacuum, right? He wasn't sent just on his own with nothing around him. Uh, he was sent in a certain environment uh, with certain people around him and things and world events, you know, unfolding around him. Uh, and then he also had uh, his companions who were there with him. So it is impossible to really separate the lives of the companions uh, from the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So part of our aqidah, part of our faith is that we believe uh, in the prophethood of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we must also believe in the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And indeed Allah testified uh, to the greatness and the rank and actually um, uh, Allah's, uh, uh, Allah's connection with the companions uh, uh, Allah tells us in the Quran that Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so for me, one source of an iman boost, uh, one source of connecting with the Prophet وسلم, uh, with Islam as a whole has been through uh, the lives of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, those people who accompanied the Prophet وسلم, those people who lived uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when we're talking about the companions, there's so many companions' uh, lives that we can look at. You know, we have the major companions amongst them, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, uh, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. Um, but it is also important to remember those companions that may not, uh, we may not always find them like uh, in the spotlight. And for me, those stories, I can particularly relate to those stories because when you look at the lives of the companions, you begin to realize very quickly um, that indeed they were number one, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, uh, he said, Khairul Quruni Qarni, he said, the best of generations is my generation. Uh, indeed, they were the best of generations. Along with that, we also realized that that doesn't mean that they were perfect, that they didn't make mistakes, that they didn't have. Um, desires that they didn't have, you know, human human problems and human issues, and so that relatability 
uh, with that generation, even though, yeah, they're the best of us and, and we can, so it's, it's, it's both, right? So we can relate to them. And that also means that, and they're the best of us. And so we can aspire to be like them. Uh, sometimes when we think of someone as being perfect, um, it's, it's hard to relate to somebody who's perfect. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, on a personal level, I think one of the things that gets lost sometimes when we look at, you know, scholars and so on and so forth is that we forget that they're human beings. And when we, if we forget that they're human beings, it becomes hard to relate to them. It's as if they are these, you know, may Allah protect us, uh, may Allah forgive us that they're somehow some of these infallible beings, right? And, and when they're telling us to do something, we're like, oh, okay, that's for you and, and for this utopia that you may live in. But, you know, I, I live in this real world where I got real problems and, you know, I'm not pious like you or, or whatever it may be. Um, and that relatability, when we lose that relatability, we, we lose a little bit um, of motivation to, to, as I said, aspire to be like them. And indeed, the companions were, were an example for us. Uh, with, with, them having all their, with them having flaws, they were an example of us because they were still uh, the best of us. Uh, and so one companion, and I have a few companions that are like my favorite companions uh, that you know, stand out for me because I tend to relate to companions that, that went through a, a really difficult time. But not only that they went through a difficult time, but you know, they chose, they chose um, a life where they, where they knew they were going to be in hardship over a life of luxury, but without Islam, right? So they chose Islam, even though they knew uh, it's going to be a tough and a difficult life. And I think well, that's one of the things that, that our generation, you know, sometimes is, is missing, and especially, you know, living in, in the, in, living in, living in the United States, living in this part of the world, um, you know, a lot of, you know, you know, first, second generation uh, immigrant, you know, kids, like we don't, we don't, but like, we don't really see like true, true hardship. And I'm not, you know, invalidating anyone's pain, and anyone's difficulty, but, you know, if we compare it to like problems that people are having across the world and the realities of the world that a lot of people, a lot of our own brothers and sisters across the world are dealing with, like we live a pretty comfortable life. Um, and so, and so to, to, to see that somebody who comes from privilege and comes from a place where, you know, they're, they're chilling basically. Um, and then because they accepted Islam, because they're devoted to Islam, uh, they had to go through an immense amount of hardship. Uh, that for me, it just really, you know, it just, it just, it just really, it's really motivating for me. Um, because sometimes when we have to sacrifice a little bit for Islam, you know, we ask 20 questions, right? Is this really fault? Like, do we have to do it or is it just recommended? Uh, is this something, and we'll, you know, go see, we'll go fetch shopping, you know, we'll look for the easiest opinion or whatever it may be, you know, we'll find a way out. And for the companions, you know, and this, that's just like minor hardships, but for companions, a lot of times it was life or death. Uh, it was an immense amount of uh, suffering and, and pain. And they still chose um, that path because they knew uh, that true happiness, uh, everlasting happiness uh, contentment in this life, happiness in this life, and happiness in the afterlife uh, lies in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why these stories are so uh, inspiring. So amongst those companions is the companion Asma, uh, the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala uh, anhum. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, let me tell you uh, where she came from and, and you know where she ended up and, and where she went. Um, so just to start off with, I'm going to let you know, spoiler alert, uh, she led a difficult life after Islam, um, but she was a tough, tough woman. Uh, she was a she was a she was a warrior, right? And that's that's for me. It's it's like it's really inspiring to to see her go through so much, uh, sacrifice so much, and be so strong and resilient through the end of it. Uh, and and once again, spoiler alert. I, I hate to jump to the end, but you know I'm short on time here. Honestly, the story I could I could this this story. If I spent two, three hours on it, I don't think it would do it justice, but you know, we only have a little bit of time. But spoiler alert, she lived to be uh, about 100 years old, right? Um, so she lived a, a long life, but it was a tough, tough life. And through all that, she persevered. Um, but where did she come from? She came from, uh, she came from the family of Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, and we know that uh, Abu Bakr uh, radiallahu anhu, he was a wealthy merchant. 
Um, he, uh, he came from a family that was a well-known, a family of nobility. And that was, that was where she was brought up. And that's the life that she was used to. But if we know the struggle of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, we know the struggle of Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, because Asma, she followed in the footsteps of her father. So just as Abu Bakr immediately became Muslim, likewise Asma radiallahu anha, she immediately became Muslim uh, as well. So when they, you know, when the scholars look back and say, you know, when did she become Muslim? Well, she became Muslim when the message of Islam came. I mean, there was no delay in that. Um, she was amongst the, the early, early people uh, to accept uh, Islam. And what's interesting about her family, subhanAllah, is that her father was Abu Bakr, uh, but her mother was actually not Muslim. Um, and, and not only that, her parents were divorced at the time of, of Islam, when, when the message of Islam came. Uh, her mother, uh, she was a woman by the name of Qutayla, um, and we'll talk about her a little bit later on as well. But she, that's, that's the house, household that she came from. But she stuck with her father. She stuck with, you know, Islam. Uh, we know her, her sister, very famous, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, anha, her half-sister. Uh, we know her brother, Abdullah bin uh, Abi Bakr, also very uh, well-known. Not only that, we know her husband, uh, Az-Zubair ibn al-Awwam, very famous also. We know her, her, her sons, very famous amongst them. Uh, Abdullah ibn al-Zubair ibn al-Awwam, very famous as well. So, you know, I keep going back to is that she was not just, once again, you know, we talk about not being in a vacuum and not being by yourself. She was strong and she had strong people around her. And so she was able to live that life uh, of strength. So, you know, her husband was, was a strong person who sacrificed a lot. And likewise, her children ended up sacrificing a lot as well for the sake of Islam. And it's obvious, like that makes sense that if they've seen their parents devoted to Islam and they've seen them sacrifice so much, then obviously do, they would do uh, the same uh, as well. Uh, her, her story is actually intertwined in the story of Islam. Her, her story is intertwined, just like her father. Uh, her story is inter intertwined with the beginnings of Islam. Uh, the Hijrah, for example, we know that uh, just a quick summary, when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, allowed the Muslims to make hijrah, they, they, we know they made hijrah from Mecca to Medina. Uh, many of the Muslims, most if not most of the Muslims had made hijrah and the Prophet sallallahu and a few other companions, uh, companions amongst them, Abu Bakr radiallahu uh, they remained behind. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was waiting for spe a specific uh, permission from Allah uh, for him to make hijrah. Um, and we know that during that time as well, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu his life was in danger because the Quraysh, the leaders of the Quraysh, they were plotting and planning uh, his murder. They were trying to kill him basically. That was the last resort for them. Uh, they're like, basically he's gonna leave. They knew like most of the Muslims had already left Mecca and they were afraid that look, if, if the Prophet Sallallahu if he leaves, then we're not gonna be able to control him and suppress the message of Islam. So they, they were very afraid of the Prophet leaving Mecca. Uh, and that's why we know that even when Prophet left Mecca, as soon as they found out, they sent a party after him uh, to find him and to you know, kill him, to get rid of him. Um, so the Prophet remained behind until the Prophet finally got the permission to go. And who accompanied the Prophet It was Abu Bakr, the close friend of the Prophet And uh, who was in Medina? At, uh, who was in Mecca at that time? Well, the family of Abu Bakr remained as well. The family of Abu Bakr hadn't made hijrah. They were waiting for their father, who was waiting for the Prophet You know, all together, they're all in this together. So if you think about who uh, who was with the Prophet Prophet it was Abu Bakr and the family of Abu Bakr radiallahu taala anhum ajma'in. Um, and you know what's also very interesting about the story of Asma is a lot of her story we hear from her. Uh, and she's actually a very famous narrator of hadith as well. She narrated a great number of hadith. Um, we know that she was very, like, she had a really good memory. She was very sharp. Uh, that's why people relied, uh, relied upon her. Even in, in her old age, the companions would go to her and ask her advice, and they would seek her counsel, and they would say, you know, what did the Prophet, Prophet ﷺ say in this matter? Because her memory was, was very sharp. Um, and that's why she narrated a lot upon the Prophet uh, ﷺ. Uh, but also we have her own story in so many different places being told. Oftentimes she will say, this is what happened with me. So she tells us of what happened 
uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was about to make hijrah. And this uh, narration, uh, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. She says that uh, I was the one who prepared uh, the, the food and everything for the Prophet ﷺ and uh, Abu Bakr uh, when they were going to make uh, hijrah to Medina. She said she prepared everything uh, from the food and everything. There was, there, there was a food container and there was a water skin and she couldn't find anything to tie it with. So she said to her father, she said, uh, she said, you know, Wallahi, I can't find anything to tie, uh, to tie, you know, these two things together, except my waist belt. Uh, and the pro and, and Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, he said, okay, if that's all you have, right, uh, then cut it in two pieces and, and tie the stuff up together so we can take it. Um, and then, you know, the, the narrator, the sub narrator of, of this narration, uh, they say that after this incident, uh, she was known as uh, that an nitaqain the, the 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 woman who had two belts right because that incident is is so famous and it was it was that uh, it, it had such an a, such an impact um on the journey of the prophet sallallahu and, and once again as you said her life tied into the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and islam and the beginnings of, of of islam so that's where you may have heard that title may not have but that uh, the woman of two belts or the woman who had two belts it comes from that early part uh, in the hijrah and so she prepared she, she herself she tells us she prepared um, you know the prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr the food and everything uh, to go uh, another well known incident uh, a story we have from that from a, from the, from that time period uh, is um, uh, once again uh, uh, asma radiyallahu anha she tells us she says that when Abu Bakr left, he took all of his wealth with him. Uh, we know this was characteristic of, of Abu Bakr and He would sacrifice, he would give a, anything and everything for the sake of the Prophet Sallallahu and for the sake of Islam. Uh, so when he left, he took everything he could take with him to support uh, Islam and to support the Prophet Sallallahu and left nothing behind. Now, um, when the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr, when they, when they left for, for Medina, um, the father of Abu Bakr, also a well-known uh, person by the name of Abu Qahafa, uh, who later on became Muslim, but at this time he's not Muslim and he's actually not in the favor of Islam at all. Um, he was an old man. He was, you know, he was pretty old at this time, uh, and and he had a really hard time seeing. Some some scholars say that he was blind. Um, he knocks on the door. He comes in uh, and he says, you know, he's really upset. And uh, he says to Asma, he says, I see that your father, just as he abandoned you, he also left you with nothing, right? Like he, there's no wealth here, there's nothing here. And Asma said, uh, she said, no, that's not the case. He, he didn't leave us with nothing. And what she did is she took some, some rocks, some pebbles, and uh, there was a little recess in the wall where people would basically, they would store all their wealth. So she put the rocks in there and she put like a, a cloth over it. Uh, and she took the hand of Abu Qahafa, you know, her grandfather, uh, and she she said, "Here, feel this." And you know, he put his his like his walking stick in, and he saw that that recess was full. And he says, "Okay, okay, I see that he's he's less he's left you with some stuff." Now, amazing, Subhanallah, her her ghira, right, her protectiveness of not only. Abu Bakr, her father, right? Because he, she knows that Abu Bakr is not doing this for, for, for his own benefit. It's not like he's going to, you know, take the wealth to enjoy it himself. She knows that he is doing it for the sake of Islam, right? And so out of wanting to protect the honor of her father and also the honor of Islam as well as a whole, right? That Islam, she didn't want anything bad to be said or thought about Islam. She said this to, to her grandfather and, and our scholars say that she didn't lie. Because when she said uh, that uh, she, uh, she, uh, our, our, uh, Abu Bakr left us with a lot, that a lot doesn't have to be material, right? It can be, uh, it can be you know, what Abu Bakr taught them, uh, the tarbiyah that, that he gave, and obviously the iman that he left them with. So out of her, and this is her, you know, her closeness to Islam, her wanting to protect Islam, her wanting to protect the honor of her father, she did that. A third incident that occurred at the very same time, and, and think about, subhanAllah, how much asma. And she was quite young at this age. She was probably uh, either in her late teens or early twenties at this time. She wasn't like an uh, in like an elderly woman or anything. She's still young. Um, so <laughs> I just got the ten minute mark, and I'm like right in the beginning of her story. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so she was so she was you know she was fairly young at this time, 
And um, so another incident we know, and once again, narrated by her, uh, is that she tells us that, uh, that a, and when the Prophet Sallallahu left, a group of the leaders of the Quraysh, they came to the house of Abu Bakr, her father, very upset, uh, saying, where is Abu Bakr? Where is Abu Bakr? And uh, at the forefront of them, uh, she says, was Abu Jahl ibn, ibn uh, Hisham. Uh, we know who Abu Jahl was. And she herself, she says that, uh, I found Abu Jahl standing at the door of Abu Bakr, meaning the house of Abu Bakr. Uh, and Abu Jahl said, where is your father, O daughter of Abu Bakr? And she said, I swear by Allah, Allah, I don't know where my father is, which is the truth. She doesn't know exactly where her father is. And she says, at that point, Abu Jahl raised his hand and, and she pauses and she says, he was certainly a, a malicious and obscene person. She says, he raised his hand and he brought it down and he struck my cheek um, so hard that my earrings, they, they flew off of, off of me, right? And then he, he walked away. Now imagine subhanAllah, going through that type of abuse, that type of torment as a teenager, as a teenage girl, as a teenage young woman. SubhanAllah, I think about, you know, when we go through some di uh, discomfort in our times and, you know, even the smallest discomfort, you, we really begin to question, you know, our life and our life choices, right? Like, oh, did I really make the right choice? Am I really on the right? Like, is this really, when we go through hardship, is this really the right path? And you know, our scholars often say that a true indication of one's sincerity um, in what they're doing, meaning are they doing it for the sake of Allah or not? A true measure of that is what happens when matters become difficult. If somebody even like I think about my life as well, and, and I've often thought about this in, in my journey, in my journey of seeking knowledge, in my journey of even teaching Islam, um, you know, there's times when, you know, in my personal life, when, when, you know, things got difficult and I, you know, especially as a student of knowledge and, you know, that whole journey that I took, there were times where, you know, and I, I'll just be real with you, there, there, there were times where I honestly considered, uh, whether I need, uh, whether I will continue in my journey of seeking knowledge. And I would remember, uh, how, you know, this very point that if I'm doing it sincerely for the sake of Allah, then that means that when things get difficult, I persevere, I keep going because it's for the sake of Allah. But if things become difficult, I'm like, nah, this is not for me. You know, okay, you know what? I'm gonna go back. I remember I was studying in Medina. I'm like, you know, I'm a grad and I graduated college when I went to Medina, right? So I have a degree from back home. I go back home, back to my comfortable life in the suburbs of Maryland, you know, get a comfy job or whatever and just live my life, you know, um, get married, get, you know, have a nice suburban house and whatever, whatever, and just chill, right? But then how sincere was I when I started my journey? Was I sincerely doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? If I was sincere, that means that even when things become difficult, I continue because this is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why her story uh, is inspiring for me personally and many other companions that went through difficult times. Um, but that is what, and but so she persevered, right? She tells this story not as a moment of disappointment, she's proud of this story, right? She's like, look, this is what happened, but, it, but that's what it was. You know, that's what we did in the beginning of Islam. I put up with that, right? Not only that, her life continued to be difficult. Even her journey to, to when she made hijrah, um, uh, we know that she was married to uh, Az Zubair ibn Awam, which I'll talk about him a little bit. I know I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'll talk about him in a little bit. But uh, she was she was married to him, um, and she was pregnant with Abdullah Abdullah ibn Zubair, who was very famous. You know, inshallah, maybe we can talk about him one day. Uh, but she says uh, during my hijrah, during my uh, immigration uh, to Mecca, I was pregnant with him, but I still traveled, right? And she says, you know, I traveled, and and I was right on the brink of giving birth. And she tells us that it was Subhanallah, she had reached Quba. And she had to give birth, so that is where she gave birth, uh, in Quba. And you can imagine, subhanAllah, this woman during her pregnancy, during the last, the end, you know, the last term of her pregnancy, traveling through the desert, traveling, you know, and the travel of that time was not like the traveling of our time. But she persevered, she gave birth in, 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 uh, in Quba, and she herself, she tells us, uh, once again, as I said, she narrates a lot of her, her own story. 
Uh, she tells us what was the reward of that, subhanAllah. Uh, the Muslims rejoiced. The Muslims became very, very happy because this was the first child born uh, after the Hijrah in Islam. And so the Muslims became very happy. The Prophet ﷺ, she tells us, uh, this narrative in Sahih Bukhari, Asma radiallahu anha, she tells us, the Prophet ﷺ himself, he came and he did tahniq for Abdullah ibn Zubair. Meaning tahniq, he, he you know, put some, took some date, um, chewed it and rubbed it on the inside of the mouth uh, of, of Abdullah ibn Zubair. And uh, she says, radiallahu anha, she says, thumma da'a lahu. He made dua for him, uh, wa baraka alayhi. He made dua for Abdullah ibn Zubair and he sought Allah's blessings for him. And this is a time of once again, and this is subhanAllah, the, the, the theme of the story of Asma. And subhanAllah, a vast uh, majority of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Allah honored them through their sacrifice. That they sacrificed in this life. And, and by the way, subhanAllah, many of the companions, you know, their sacrifices, like we can't really even imagine like how difficult it was for them. And in their life, many of the companions, they never saw comfort. So when they when they when they when they sacrificed and they started a hard life, their life remained hard till the very end, right? That they there was no relief for them. Yet Allah honored them in this life till today. We make dua for them, radiallahu anhum. And obviously in the afterlife, we know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know the reward uh, in the afterlife. But that was that was as I said, that was that was her sacrifice for the sake of Islam. She married um Az Zubair radiallahu uh, anhu. Uh, Az Zubair came from uh, Az Zubair radiallahu anhu was very poor, and once again you're talking about sacrifice. Asma radiallahu anha, we said her father was wealthy. She came from a fairly wealthy household, yet she agreed to marry Az Zubair even though he was very very poor, and especially when uh, they made hijrah to Medina, uh, Asma once again in her own she tells us herself she's she narrates her you know this part of her story. She says that. You know, I married a Zubair and he had no wealth and no possessions. All he had, she tells us, he had a camel and I believe he had a horse. And she said, I would tire myself, I would work and I would go grind the dates uh, to give to, uh, to feed, uh, to feed uh, the animals that we had. And there's a couple incidents where she was just hungry. She said, I had good neighbors. They would come and, you know, they would give us, uh, you know, they would bake bread for us. Uh, and she said, sometimes I would sit there and I could smell the food uh, from our from uh, uh, our uh, our neighbors. Um, and that is, you know, that is a life that that uh, Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha lived. But once again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her with with amazing children. Uh, and I know my my time is uh, is running out. Um, but even she had to witness uh, the death of her child, uh, Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu ta'ala uh, anhu. Uh, but she was still strong uh, till the very end. And her death was actually just a couple of days after the death of her beloved son, uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair. Um, as I mentioned earlier, she was about 100 years old. And in that time, even uh, we have um, reports uh, that uh, she, uh, not only did she persevere in her, uh, in her relationships, uh, in her relationship with her husband, radiallahu ta'ala uh, anhum, but also uh, she was a, a warrior. Uh, there are reports that she even fought in the battle of Yarmouk, that there were women who fought in the battle of Yarmouk uh, and she fought very, very fiercely. So, you know, when you talk about being tough, she was tough in, in every sense of, of the word, not just tough in, okay, I can, I can go through hardship and I can persevere. And that is indeed a, 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 an, an amazing quality of toughness but also physical toughness uh, to physically be the force that she was uh, um, and she survived that. And as I said, you know, she died close to the age of uh, hundred years old. Uh, some of our scholars mentioned that uh, it's an interesting point. They mentioned, they, they say that uh, even though she was hundred years old, she had all of her teeth, right? So that, that, is, that is who she was, this, this strong warrior of a woman. Um, and in every, in every department, subhanAllah, uh, you know, when her, as we, we spoke about her knowledge, we spoke about her narrating uh, hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We spoke about how, you know, the companions would, the companions would seek her advice. Uh, when her son Abdullah, by the way, uh, was, was Khalifa, 
right? When he was, uh, when he was uh, defending, when he was fighting for, to, uh, when he was um, uh, in a battle, right? He came and sought her advice as well until he was martyred. So she saw her death, she saw uh, the death of her child. And then eventually uh, she lived her life as well. Once again, not a short life, a long life, but a life full of uh, hardship and difficulty. Uh, but for me, once again, the main, one of the main themes here um, is how Allah honors people uh, when they sacrifice uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and that is the story of her story and the story of many of our companions. Uh, sacrifice uh, and devotion, both of them go hand in hand. Um, and there is a reason, subhanAllah, why the companions have such a high uh, status in Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all of them. And Allah knows best. And I apologize for cutting out so much of the story. Uh, but Sheikh Walid is here, I believe, and um, I would love to hear uh, the, story, the story he has for us uh, as well. Inshallah, we will try and continue this story at another time, another day. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wa jazakumullahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Honestly, it hurts me more than it hurts everyone uh, for us to move on from the story. But alhamdulillah <laughs> that we have our, our curiosity peaked. And honestly, I haven't heard enough about the story of Asma ibn Zabi Bakr. So this is kind of, uh, it's a pleasure. And I'm, I'm happy to see that a lot of our shiu highlighted female, uh, you know, female companions and, and kind of leaders in Islamic history so that we have a, a large female audience watching as well. So it's a pleasure to have our curiosity peak about that. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Saad. Um, I have like questions and so much I wanted to to ask you, but I know we don't have a lot of time for Q&A. Um, but of course, you've probably heard by now that al Maghrib has launched its kind of biggest, most ambitious project yet, uh, Alhamdulillah, with the, the kind of beginnings of al Maghrib kids that are ready to kind of go. And uh, we have a, an ambitious project up on LaunchGood through almaghrib.org slash kids where you can support. But you were once upon a time, once upon a time, the youngest sheikh that we had uh, on the al Maghrib. Not rock. true. Not oh, true. you weren't. Even I was when you came never in. the youngest Sheikh, maybe the youngest looking Sheikh, maybe okay. you can get away with that. Uh, but I was never the uh, youngest Al Maghrib. Wow, big, myth big debunked. I thought it, yeah. you were the youngest for a bit, and then somebody came out. Oh, wow, myth debunked. I should know Absolutely this by now. Never, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure so I'm going to let the cow, cat out of the bag right here. Uh, Sheikh Umar Salman, Allah Hafadu, uh, is younger than me. Whoa. Uh, and he was hired, I believe, a, like a few months b before me. Mashallah. So, not true. So, yeah. No way. Okay. I, yeah, I had no idea yeah. you held that title. Khair, I'm sure yeah. Allah And I'm not saying he's the youngest, you know, there may be yeah. somebody younger, but that's that's from what I know. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I'm still still sure that Amalgam had a huge impact on your youth. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we were excited, as a lot of us are who grew up with the Amalgam family, um, about the fact that youth are now able to benefit and even at younger ages able to incorporate the, uh, you know, the learnings that we have as an institution. What are you most excited to hear about when it comes to, you know, Amalgam and uh, being able to teach the youth? What do you think, especially with a father as a father of two young boys yourself, uh, that you'll be most excited uh, from the new program? Uh, look, I'm just like, I, I can speak in general. I'm just very excited that, uh, look, there, to me, there's a whole generation of people who have now grown up with Al-Maghrib. Um, and I, I would say that's kind of like my generation because uh, I started seeking, when I started seeking knowledge, I actually, uh, some of the first things I did is I took Al-Maghrib classes. Al-Maghrib was brand new back then. And so my life till now in my Islam, I've grown with Al-Maghrib uh, till today even, subhanAllah. So I'm very happy to see a new generation uh, take part in that and have Al-Maghrib be a part of their life. Uh, and Al-Maghrib is always, always, for me, it's been more than just, you know, uh, acquiring information. It, for me, a big aspect of Al-Maghrib has been tarbiyah, uh, has been the impact that it has on our lives, on our character, on our relationships, uh, in our communities. And I'm, I'm super excited to see this next generation uh, you know, be able to take advantage uh, of this blessing. Alhamdulillah. And I hope, you know, my, my, my two sons, Laith and Sufyan, you know, I'm, 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 I'm rooting for, for Al-Maghrib to have an impact on their lives as well, inshallah. 
Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Very well said, Sheikh. Uh, I wish we had more time with you, but inshallah, I know you have, you're very active all across the interwebs. So we look forward to, not a dig, not a dig, uh, to, to keeping up with sure. you uh, with at Sheikh Saad Taslim, I think across all social uh, platforms and uh, looking forward to the content that you're coming up with, some exciting al Maghrib content that you're coming up with early yes. in 2021. Yes. Take care, stay safe until then, and we'll touch base with you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good to see you, Sheikh, and good to hear from you too. Jazakallah. Yeah. Allah ibarak fiq, Sheikh. It's very nice to see you. Salam you have Sheikh. the youngest heart, mashallah. May Allah, 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 Allah keep Sheikh. you always uh, in a great uh, health, great condition. And um, it was very nice to hear the story of us now. Jazakallah khair. Ameen wa iyaakum. Allah yirda alaykum. Barakallah fiqum, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. Amazing. And of course, now you guys have already heard from, alhamdulillah, our, our next speaker, Sheikh Walid Basuni. Assalamu alaikum wa Sheikh. You know, it's going to be hard not to see you without that turquoise background. <laughs> it's, wow. it's the first thing I think of now. I think you've stolen it from Sheikh Kamal, mashallah. May Allah reward him as well. I mean, Inshallah. how are you doing, We're going to paint the wall. <laughs> Sorry? We're going to paint the wall. No, don't do that. <laughs> this, is, this is the most serene, kid-friendly. Everyone chime in in the chat. I know, mashallah, a lot of you have joined us since. Uh, if you like the color of Sheikh Walid's wall right now, don't repaint it, Sheikh. Not until you get a vote. <laughs> um, but we're looking forward to it. Alhamdulillah, I know, sorry, we're tight on time, but I'm so excited to have you back with us. And your, your topic is actually very fascinating. Your topic today is Saved by Sincerity, the story of three men trapped in a cave, inshallah. So we have the next half hour with Sheikh Walid uh, to jump into this story time. Everyone else who's coming in with their family, I see a lot, a few hundred people have joined in since we started. So welcome, make sure you have your drinks, your snacks, everything ready to go and settle in for Sheikh Walid's talk. This Thank you time. for the compliment for the background. Thank you. Uh, there's, uh, yeah, Meza Khan and uh, kids getting excited about it. Sabina, that's nice. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Okay. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala hu ba'd. Today I would like to talk to you about um, a story that you might heard a lot before, but um, or you are familiar with, or some of you or good number of you familiar with. It's a very famous story, but what I promise you that there is a lot of uh, new perspectives in the stories that it might be new to you and an, 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 an inspiration, inshallah, for, for you. Um, those who are saved by sincerity. Al Imam al Bukhari, rahimahullah, and Muslim reported this story. And it is important for us to learn through stories. Um, and I like the program that is based on stories. And this is not some, this is not only educator talking about in modern days as one of the best format of teaching. This is how Al Quran taught us. Al Quran filled with the stories, and his Sunnah and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam filled with the story. That's how he taught. That's how he raised the companions of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he also inspired Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah told them, "I told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm telling you the stories of the prophets and the nations before you to give you strength, so you will be inspired by them." And Al Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah used to say, I, I love to read the stories of the scholars more than reading their opinions in fiqh, because their stories are always ibrah, are always idal, always a reminder for us, uh, uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran about qasasihim, fi qasasihim la ibrah. In their stories, there is a lesson for you to learn and to be inspired. Um, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab uh, radiallahu anh, reported, that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, three persons set out on a journey. They were overtaken by rain. So they uh, sought protection in a mountain cave. A rock fall at the mouth of the cave. What happened? They basically were blocked inside, thereby blocking them inside. One of them said to the others, Look at your, in one, some other narrations, they stayed for a while and they thought, they tried to find any exit. There's no exit. They tried to push the rocks. They couldn't remove the rocks. So they, th they thought this is going to be their grave. But one of them said to the others, look to your good deeds that you performed for the sake of Allah. And then supplicate Allah, the exalted subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
that he might rescue you from this trouble. So now they're going to go back in memory and think about the best deeds that they did out of complete sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of that deed to let them go. So one of them said, Oh Allah, I had my parents who were old and my wife and my small children also live all to live together. Every night when I return with the milk, I would serve my parents first before anyone else. One day, I was obligated to go out to a distance place in search uh, um, of, um, you know, uh, to do some uh, tasks, okay? And I could not come back before late evening. And I found my parents asleep. I, I have already the milk. I milked the animals as I used to milk and brought the milk to them. And, but they were sleeping. I stood by their heads, avoiding to disturb them from their sleep. And I did not deem it advisable to serve milk to my children and my family before them. He, in another version, he said, I was thinking, should I wake them up? But if I wake them up, that will be disturbing them. And they are old. They want to rest. But in the same time, I couldn't go and eat and just relax while I know my parents went to bed hungry because there is no other food. There's nothing else they eat other than that milk. My children wept near my feet. I, rem I remained there in that which very state, waiting for my parents until it was the morning. And even his children wanted food, but he said to them, wait, wait, you can wait, you, you know, I want, maybe they will wake up on their own, but they did not until the morning. And when they wake up in the morning, he served them. And in some of the narration that his parents said, you should have not done that, no need for that. But he did it because how much he loves and respects his parents. And O oh Allah, if you know that I did this in order to seek your pleasure, grant us uh, relief from uh, this trouble and from basically the situation that they are uh, in. When he said that, the rock split a bit. They tried to get out from that crack, but they, uh, there is no way they couldn't even see the sky or to make that crack bigger. So the second one said, Oh Allah, I had a female cousin whom I loved more than anyone else. I wanted her and I want to have a sexual intercourse with her. She refused. However, a year come upon her in which she was in a dare financial need. She came to me asking for help. I agreed to give her 120 pieces of gold, dinars, if she would allow me to intimate with her. When I was going to intimate with her, to have intercourse with her, she said, Ya Abdullah, O oh servant of Allah, and if you want me that bad, fear Allah. And don't break the seal of chastity, basically, but by lawful means. I've never been with a man before. If this is what you want to do so bad, at least do it in halal way, in, 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 a, in a lawful way. And you can tell she doesn't want to marry him, but the situation, if this is the case, okay. I got up and left, despite my desire for her and his ability to fulfill whatever he wants, because she submitted herself to him. Leaving the gold behind as a gift to her, and I said, the gold's yours, don't, I don't want you, and I don't want my gold back. Oh Allah, if you know that I did this in order to seek your pleasure, relieve us from this trouble. And the crack start getting bigger but they still could not exit from the place. 
the third man said, O Allah, I employed some workmen and I paid all of them except one who left without getting paid. I used his wages to grow crops until it granted a large sum of, you know, uh, riches. After a time, he came to me and asked for his dues. I said to him, take away all what you see before you. So he used that money to grow a little bit, of, to grow small land, the land stopped producing, and whatever produced, he used it to gain more capital. He invested more again and again and again. It looks like for a while, for years or so. And he, it became a big, huge farm. And, and there's cattle in it and everything. Then he said, do you see this land, this farmland in front of you? It's all yours. The farms and the cattle, the workmen. I can't, can't believe what he's heard. They all belong to me. He said, please don't mock me. Don't make fun of me. He said, the employer said, I'm not ma I'm making fun of you. So it is all yours. And he told him what happened. Then he took them all. So the man was coming to just have that wages. Um, that small amount of money and ended up with all this wealth. Then he said, oh Allah, if you know that I did this for your sake, for your pleasure, so bring us a relief from this situation. And all of a sudden the crack became bigger and in one location it split or it just became so big that it was enough, wide enough for them to get out from the cave. This hadith uh, reported by Sayyid al Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Ahmad, uh, all of them reported this from Hadith Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu wa arda. And as I, I said earlier, there is so many things we can learn from this hadith. And that's what I want to focus on with you. So make this as a case study. How can we focus on the stories and learn from it? so many things? And I would be very happy to see your lessons as well as I go and see what lessons that you can come up with as well. So the first one, which is one of the most obvious one, it's the virtue of being good to your parents. This man, his the, the reason, the good deeds that he did, that he really taking good care of his parents and he respected them so much and cared for their well-being so much that every day he would bring them milk. Even the day that he missed the milk and he missed to bring them a dinner, that he couldn't go to sleep, knowing that his parents didn't eat. He stood just, up, just right next to them. It shows you that he let his old parents live with him, taking care of them, him and his family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا This is Surah Al-Isra and in Surah Al-Nisa before that وَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran in many different يعني, verses and all of them the same concept which is Worship Allah, take good care of your parents. It's Allah comes first, then after that your mother, after that your father. That's how the order is. And that's how should we look, when we look at our life, that's where the order is. That's how our children should be taught. That Allah, my, my, my mother, my father. It's not Allah that my game, it's not Allah that my... Uh, uh, you know, my friends, not Allah, then my, you know, my spouse or no, it's my parents. And, that, and that's something so important to be raised upon and to be taught and to be recognized. It's very important to learn how important it is to be good to your parents. وَبَرًّا 
when Allah want to praise Yahya, Prophet Yahya, John, he told, he said that he was good to his parents. He was good to his parents. وبرن, and, Mar, and for Maryam's son, which is Isa alayhi salam, Allah mentioned that he was good to his mother. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised the believers, he praised them because they show humility to their parents with mercy. And they never say, oof. That's the smallest thing. Like blowing the air. Or like, even some of the ulama, rahimahullah, Qatara said, he said, just to make your hand like this, this hand gesture, oh, you know, that's uquq al-walidain. That's a sin. That's haram. Looking, staring at them with anger, that's haram. That's a major sin. It's not, it's not a minor sin. That's a major thing. And it should not be taken lightly. So what do you think of something bigger than that? And higher than that? النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم في الصحيحين من حديث عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه He said I asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم what's the deed that Allah loves the most? He said to pray on time. Then what? He said to be good to your parents. Then what? He said الجهاد في سبيل الله. He put parents before الجهاد في سبيل الله. When a man came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said يا رسول الله I want to move and be with you join enlisted in your army and he said you have parents? He said yes. Are they, are they okay with that? He said, no, I left them in their village crying. He said, no, go back to them. Go back to them and make them laugh as you made them cry. From this hadith, you should, even the Nabi told us to make our parents laugh and to put that smile in their faces. It's to care for them. Fisun Abi Dawood, father is the middle gate of Jannah. And another narration, parents are the middle gate in Jannah. And we know there is gates in Jannah. For each gate, you know, there is designated for certain people who practice this act of worship in the best way, like fasting, a rayyan. The people fast a lot. There is a door called a rayyan for them, those who pray a lot. And so, and in Jannah also, there is a special gate for those who take good care of their parents. Innabi Sassan said, Rahim Amfu, Rahim Amfu, Rahim Amfu, Sayyid Muslim, a loser, a loser, a loser. The one who will witness one of his parents old and that person, his sins or her sin will not be forgiven. That's not only for boys, that's for boys and for girls. One of the uh, uh, lessons as well, here somebody said, being truthful, even if it's harm you in words because are being truthful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so absolutely being truthful because what's truthfulness means? It means you doing it truly for Allah. You know what? His parents asleep. When they woke up in the morning, he can bring the milk or say, hey, the milk was here. He can go away with it. But he's he dealing with Allah and he wants Allah to see from him that he really cares so much about them. He couldn't go to sleep. It didn't allow him. Even if he went to sleep, it will be absolutely understandable. This hadith also shows you that it is important for you to abstain from adultery. Why this man, what is his deeds was? that he was capable of performing adultery, zina, then he stopped himself. And that shows you that those who stop themselves from the haram, while they are capable of doing it, their reward is much higher than those who stop themselves from something haram, it's just because, you know, uh, 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 because they can't do it. That's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a man who will be in the shade of Allah, a woman who is powerful, who is beautiful, seduced him and he said, no, I fear Allah. So the hadith made this very special you know, case. Why? Because if he was seduced by a woman, he is not attractive at her at all. And he said, no, that's not really necessarily to be for the sake of Allah. Or, he basically, this is another thing. She's powerful. She will, he's seduced by a woman, but he was scared of the, the consequences of his uh, actions or the outcome, or he might be 
punished, but this is powerful woman should protect him. And she might reward him. But he said, no. I only say no for Allah. A man said a story to me. He, he traveled to a country. And this country known for prostitution, okay? So he said, I went, and i be honest, I went there to party, to drink, to, you know, to do the halal thing. He said, when I went, when I entered the country, I went to the hotel and entered my, the room of my hotel, okay? He said, uh, uh, I don't know if he found it in the drawer or, or a closet or somewhere. And he said this paper, and in it was written, in Allah Yarak. Allah sees you. He said, I took it, I cried, I took my bags and I checked out from the hotel and I went back and I, tried, I, I left. I left. It, it just hit him. You know, it is so important to know that this, this, is, this is a great quality in the person. Also, another number three, I have a lot of points. I'm going to go fast a little bit. I have over 40 points just for you to know. So whatever I can do, I will share. Um, The virtue of trustworthiness and honesty. And that's something that we just talked about. You know, this honest man who did not take the wages of that man, he kept it, he invested it, and he gave him all the outcome of it, even though the money becomes so big and so huge. But that's an honest person. That's a person, is a trustworthy person. And, and that's so amazing. How the person came, you know, he gave him, he did not only care about saving that person's wages, but no, he invested it. And he invested it like the way he invests his own money. Then he gave the guy everything. And Allah, when he praised the believers in Surah Al-Mu'minun, he said, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ Those who will protect their amana. Whatever, they are honest, they protect the trust that the people trusted them with. Abu Hurairah radiallahu an said that the Prophet ﷺ said, اشترى رجل من رجل عقارا له A man purchased a house from another person. And when he moved to that house, basically he found inside the house jarratan min dahab, a big container filled with gold. He go back to the owner of the house. He said, I purchased from you the house and the land and I found this gold in it. Take it back because I didn't buy that. Then the man said, yeah, but this is, was like, it, it looks like it was buried in the backyard. He said, it's okay. You can keep it because it's yours, because I sold you the land and what is in the land and outside uh, on the top of the land. He said, no, I didn't. Can you imagine yani, both saying, you keep the money, you keep the money. It's a big container full of gold. Then they see someone to judge between them. Then uh, uh, the person who they uh, uh, say his judgment told him, Alakuma walad, qala ahaduhum ali ghulam, wa qala al akhar li ajariya. He said, You have children? He said, Yeah, I have a young man uh, and I have a young girl or a young woman. I have a daughter. He said, Are they in marriage, like uh, uh, age of marriage? He said, Yes, they are single. They said, why don't you marry them to each other and give them the money so they can start their own life? And they did. Oh, I have one minute left? No, man, I just started it. One hour left. Okay. No, no one minute, man. Uh, I just started. Like, uh, we started ex- like 3.36. Anyway, uh, let's go quickly. Um one of the things that it protects you from harm, a dua, a dua, a dua. One of the best ways to protect yourself from trouble, to bring relief to you. Sincerity, one of the major reasons for your deeds to be powerful. You, the more sincere you are, 
the more likely you can get out of trouble. So remember this. Sometimes we try to lie. No, don't. Be sincere and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring relief to you. Another one, intercession through good deeds. You can ask Allah by your good deeds. When you want to pray, you can say, Ya Allah, if you know I did this and this for your sake and this, why I do it for you, bring relief for, for me. And this is one of the permissible way of uh, seeking tawassul or intercession. Um, and sometimes, like somebody told me once a very sad thing, he said, Sheikh, sometimes when I think about my deeds, I couldn't think of something very special. But maybe you would, inshallah ta'ala. Um, it doesn't need to be so dramatic like that, but it could be something that, you know what, I wake up in Fajr and it was cold and I didn't go back to sleep and I prayed. That's just this beautiful thing. Also, number seven, no matter how things look so gloomy and, and, and dark, you know what? The light is coming. There is a relief coming. If you are in that cave with them, you never think that there is a relief will come. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring the relief. And the relief not necessarily to come through materialistic means. It could, it, it, because everything in the hand of Allah. Allah brought relief to them through their deeds that they did in the past. Okay? So this is something also you should keep in mind. And there was a lot of example. Another point. Uh, this woman, who uh, the cousin of that man, came uh, and agreed to intimate with this man in haram to offer her body uh, to this man because of the need of money, because of her poverty, because of the, situ the financial situation that the she was in. I think that's a great reminder for all of us to know that there is not every woman who would agree to do things that she knows it's it be below her dignity. She's doing it because she's enjoying it. She might doing it because she'd really need to help her children, to take care of herself, to, to pay for her college, to pay for her. I'm not saying that just justification, but it is more important than just looking to condemn people, also to know what the reasons behind their actions. And that's something if we work in taking that, these reasons away and solving the issue of poverty, maybe many women will not sell their bodies and offer their bodies in front of cameras. Also, Another thing that we see that these three people did three different things, three different areas. And one has to do with the parents, one has to do with some worker, and one has to do with, you know, a, a family member like cousins. Um, this is about avoiding zina. This is about burial holiday. What I'm trying to say here, there is so many good deeds in Islam. There is, you don't know which deed can lead you to Jannah, which deed can save you. And that shows you the variety of option that you have. Also, uh, what I think, when I think of the story, especially the man who stood up the whole night with the milk, he didn't, what he did is not something wajib. If he didn't do that, he's still okay. If he didn't provide the food for them, it is still not haram. Okay, but he still did that. Because sometimes it's not about what is I am obligated to do. It is what I'm inspired to do. We should aim high. It's not about also it is wajib or not. Is this the this is the way that I would love to do? I would love to offer the best. He's consistent in offering that milk to his parents, and he wants to continue with that consistent. Also, uh, uh, the first one it shows you how you deal with your maharim, with your parents, with your relatives who are not uh, related to you, and with the war the people who work for you. Another lesson, you know, we should learn as a du'at, as people call to Islam and, and, and wish to see people change, that we never give up hold in people. Can you imagine this man who wants this woman so badly, he'd been planning for it all these years, and he took advantage of her, and he did all this evil thing. When you think about this man, you think of some predator, that's right, but still yet he feared Allah and Allah accepted from him. That's why he relieved him from that trouble. Don't ever, no matter how ugly, how bad the sin looks like, you know what? The sinner can be someone forgiven, can be, can be changed. As they say, hate the sin, not the sinner. You know, with, with reservation on the statement. Okay. I love that the Prophet ﷺ bring the story of this man who seduced his cousin in a very positive manner. You know, 
the story, the moral of the story is not how bad this man is and how he's taking advantage of the woman. It's how good he become. In Nabi Sallam focused on the story, on the positive part of this man's life. We should not look only into the negative in people's life, but we should look at the positive things. I bet you anything, if one of us said the story, he would say, yeah, but he did this, but, but, but. And we will still go back to the negative dark part or area of the story. But the Nabi Sallam did not do that. Also, who knows Allah in the time of ease, Allah knows them and help them in the time of shidda, in the time of hardship. Also, one of the things that no matter how, not, and when the rock came and blocked them inside the cave, I said, No matter how smart you are, if Allah decreed something to, to happen to you, it will happen. Why did they run to the cave? To protect themselves. And now they became in more trouble. You know, that's why the really thing that will protect you is Allah and the dua and the dhikr and your sincerity. Because no matter how many, you know, time you try to be smart to protect yourself, you can. Can you give me just one minute, Hafsa, and I will end. Uh, uh, one minute. Okay. Um, always have good faith in Allah. Expect nothing but good. They said, pray to Allah and Allah will bring relief. Husn al-dham billah. Also, one of the things that it is benefit from this, it's okay to, to tell your good deeds, even if you did it sincerely for Allah, after you did it for a good reason. Also, one of the things that we learn, one of being good to your parents, not to wake them up and not to disturb them, not to cause, you know, disturbing to them. Also, sometimes a dua can be delayed for a reason, for a wisdom. When the first men make the dua, Allah did not bring the exit right away until the three of them stated their good. Also, another thing, sometimes the one who stab you from the back is the closest one to you. That's why this man, his cousin, this is his cousin, female cousin, and he wants her. And, and this is terrible, you know. And also it shows you that the Sharia closed the door of haram from all aspects. That's why, you know, she has to go to, to have hijab and blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, one of the things that, you know, a shaitan always like to make the haram looks attractive when the halal is nothing. She told him, marry me. And he said, no. But he wants her in haram, but not in halal. And his shaitan plays the trick with us. He makes us do the haram, even though we have alternatives, which is halal for us. When you attach yourself to a woman or to a man in a haram way, it is very, very possible you end up being the haram itself and the zina as this man was about to do. Leaving the haram for Allah, it's one great act of worship. You should realize how important this is. And always fear Allah if, if you are close to do something haram. I love that young girl. She said, don't do it. She care about her honor. And that's every sister she should care about her honor. To protect herself. Don't be with a man alone even if he teach you Al-Quran. Don't be with a woman alone even if you teach her Al-Quran. Going back to what is right is better than continuing the wrong. A toba, when it comes, it wipes everything back. When you hire someone to do the job, pay them, pay them well, and don't ever delay paying them. And you make sure that you give them the rights. And if somebody trusts you or something, don't betray the trust. Anyway, there's a lot to be said, but uh, 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 yeah, I, need, uh, I hope that in the time of calamity, as we go through this pandemic, we can think of many of the good deeds that we did to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by it. And that's, if this is the only thing we can learn today, I hope it will be very beneficial to us as we go forward. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help all of us to be protected, to protect our family, our wealth, our health. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us al Jannah. I'm very, very thankful. Please don't hate Hafsa. She's a great uh, uh, sister, you know, please. She's just, she just doing the right thing. I'm doing the wrong thing, being going too much. But she was generous enough to give me extra point. I'm not rushing, I'm just giving you, but I hope, I, I mentioned, by the way, about 30, 34 points. Okay, so thank you very much. And, and I'm very, very pleased to be here. And I hope you guys are enjoying this program, that week program of stories. Looking forward to see you guys soon, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum. And please, uh, I want to say this also, as we end this year, one of the things that I really, 
I wasn't asked to do that, but I do this because I do believe in it. Please donate to Al Maghrib, help Al Maghrib, and keep Al Maghrib strong as we go. Thank you. Jazakallah, especially for that point at the end, because it's always the hate comes over here. I no, trust me, I don't want to cut you off, especially mashallah yep. yourself. You're the the king of the stories of of, of Maghrib Institute. But uh, alhamdulillah, that we got a benefit from all all the way to 34 lessons of 40. We need a book for this, mashallah. Um, but we look forward to having you back. And alhamdulillah, for everyone, I'm reminding you guys. I know we want more and more time with this issue. We want more and more to learn from them. But they have so many exciting courses and things going on. If you just head over to amalgrib.org, you'll see, you can search for courses and you'll see which is Sheikh Walid Bisuni. You'll see so many exciting things happening for next year. So don't worry. Um, and if anything, especially something that's super family friendly is Faith Essentials. And Sheikh Walid has the most number of, of series and sessions and stories and courses on there. So you can catch him other places as well. Inshallah, we're not going to lose him after this session. And we look forward to having more of you, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair for your story Thank and you. for your time today. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much to everyone who stuck around and who's come in through this session. Alhamdulillah, I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did uh, as well. And thank you again. Actually, I, I remember I asked in the beginning for those of you who uh, had any any votes to say for the wall color, Jazakallah for, for, to Iman, who uh, wrote a whole paragraph about why turquoise was the best color to stick around with. So Alhamdulillah, I'll pass that along to the Sheikh as well. He's just left the session. The next session I'm very, very excited about um, because it is we're going to turn it a little bit more and everyone, you guys, you're going to have to warm up your fingers. You're going to have to clear your throats. If you're drinking something, finish it off really quickly because this session is going to require you to be involved, to be interacting, to be engaging. You're not just going to be listening to this story. And this is why we, we, we save the best for last. Alhamdulillah. We're going to be joined by Sheikh uh, uh, Imam Wassam. Sharif, inshallah, and he's going to be doing an interactive story time uh, about the story of the cave. So bear with us. He's joining us just briefly right now, inshallah. Um, and while he does that, I want to make sure that you guys are nice and warmed up. In the meantime, I also wanted to remind you guys of something that's super, super exciting. Alhamdulillah, we've had a chance to really delve into the importance of learning for kids and the exciting project that Al-Maghrib has going on. But one of the things that I think always kind of slips under the floorboards that always gets kind of missed throughout the year, and I am very guilty of this unfortunately as well is our maintaining our connection with the, uh, the not only the meaning of the Quran but the recitation of the Quran and I was just checking out subhanallah uh, a little while ago that Ramadan is literally like four and a half months away the majority of the year has raced by I know Ramadan came at the beginning of this pandemic and now we're racing to the next one and I realize myself to be honest that I'm struggling a little bit when it comes to my recitation when it comes to the perfection of my re my recitation and and alhamdulillah, um, although I've been, uh, you know, I've been struggling, there is actually a program out there that's perfect for this, especially for those of you who are stuck at home, who maybe can't visit personal, uh, you know, your Quran teachers and stuff like that, who maybe are, are kind of falling behind when it comes to your recitation, or who just have years and years just intended every year, yeah, I need to perfect that every Ramadan comes by, oh, why is my recitation so bad, but haven't had an opportunity to do so. And alhamdulillah, that program is Quran Revolution. And the goal of it is to remove all of the barriers that we have uh, associated with learning your tajweed, learning how to recite and perfect your recitation of the Quran, so that next time someone asks you to do so in a family gathering, or next time you have to open the Quran in Ramadan and hopefully every day throughout the year, inshallah, you're able to do so confidently and comfortably and excitedly knowing how beautiful your recitation is going to be and how amazing that experience is going to be. Uh, there's a lot of barriers, unfortunately, these days to learning the Quran, you know, even when it comes to some of the terminology that you may not be familiar with. Uh, you know, you're, we're, we're in the West used to speaking in English and, and, and not sometimes not knowing the definitions or how to utilize the terminology. Sometimes it's just you don't have enough time for it. Sometimes you have is just such a busy schedule you're running around trying to keep your life going and I know life is kind of settled down in some ways uh but still there's a lot you know going on in the world it's so hard to make time for it unfortunately and that's how the shaitan gets you alhamdulillah Quran revolution takes away a lot of those difficulties, a lot of the stressors that come with learning the Quran uh, traditionally, and it makes it easy all throughout just a simple app that you download on your phone. You have a whole community of support. You have TAs, you have teacher, uh, Imam Musam Sharif, who's going to be joining us shortly, inshallah, and you fall in love with reciting the Quran again. You feel good about it again. So I'm sure you're going to hear more about it, but I just wanted to kind of introduce uh, that to you. Now, I see that Imam Musam Sharif is with us. I know he was patiently with us earlier as well. So so I don't want to steal any more of his time. Imam Sam, how are you doing today? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Doing well. How are you doing today, Hafsa? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I'm doing well. I've been sneaking in here and there. I saw you live a few times on the Among Your page. Haven't yeah. caught all of them, but uh, I know this is going to be an interactive session and I'm excited to see more of that, inshallah, today with your story time, the story of the cave, inshallah. I'm going to pass it off to you, but feel free to grab me anytime that you want during the session. You so. got it. Barakallahu feekum. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My first request as you've been listening to scholars and speakers around the world and you didn't have to travel, is that correct? You didn't have to travel anywhere. So that one in the chat box, if you're ready to join me, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, up here, come on down, friends. I'd like you to take a stand and bring it up over here today so that we can have some energy together. So we'll only be up here for a moment, but I want you to stand up so that you can hear a part of the story. So a one in the chat box, if your audio is solid, I want you up and standing. And I would like you to, if you have a Quran, you can take your Quran out and just imagine the first story. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you're up, you're in the chat box. Beautiful people, thank you for telling me. Let's get it on. With the praise and thanks going to our Lord and salutations on Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I welcome you all to our continued program. But my portion of the program is to time travel with you back to a time where Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was married to his first spouse. Alayhi salatu was salam was married to Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And can I get in the chat box? What were the jobs that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had? What were the jobs that he held? Job number one, shepherd. He took care of the animals. Excellent. Number two, Ibrahim and friend, trade, merchant, trader. Can you tell me what the third job was? Take your time on this one. A job is something you do for more than 40 hours a week. After he finished trading, okay, husband, and while he was the husband of Khatija radiallahu ta'ala anha, what was something he did once a week, several times a month, and did for hours on end? Meditation is a big word. Let's take it down to the simplest concept. Did he visit Ghar of Hira, the cave of Hira? Yes, there you go. And I know you're saying that messenger, but before he was a messenger, before you called him, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, harisun alaykum, nabiyyit tawba, nabiyyit raha, before you said muzammil and muddathir upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he do? And now work with me. He traveled from his house, basically the haram, in and around, let's say around the haram in Mecca. He traveled a good 45 minutes straight out. You can see it if you come out of the haram. Can't you see the God of Hira? If you Googled it right now from Mecca, you can look over and it's a good 45 minute travel. It's a walk. So you're walking and he would make this trek with some dates, some water, excuse me, some dates, maybe a, a yogurt, a, a laban kind of drink. And then he would take himself up there for what, friends? And now this gets the real question. Did he lean on the wall and just be like, I'm ready, Jibreel, alayhi salam. Come on down, bring that revelation. How long was he there, friends? So you can say he went from anywhere to three days at a time, one day, three days, up to 20 plus days. Our Nabi alayhi salatu was salam was in the cave. So we have the time stamped. What's the duration of this job? And I think you know this answer. How long for how many years did he go and come from the cave? Okay. That's 10 years. So 10 years going and coming. And could somebody try? Give me a touch on this one. What was his purpose in, the, in going to the cave? Was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seeking enlightenment? Was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Okay, contemplation. Give me a little bit more, guys. What was he contemplating? Looking, sitting in the ghar of Hira, there's an etch, there's an opening in the cave where you can look out the mountain and you could see the Kaaba at his time. 
Okay, some are saying uh, meditation, uh, creation of Allah. Friends, you're, you're adorable in your approach. And I say that with love. Uh, he went there because of the atrocities of his town. People made tawaf naked. People buried their daughters. Um, uh, women were treated uh, worse than slaves. Slaves had their own rights. Women were just another category. My Nabi went to contemplate the ills of his society. People cheated in the scales. My Nabi went up and got himself away from those things. Could you make that connection in the in the nakedness of the world that you live in today? The lawlessness, the get rich or die trying mentality, the, the wealth, the money, cars, cash and clothes of dunya. Take that nakedness, take that lawlessness, take the perceived freedom that women are given and look at their look at their rights as we speak now are they being protected or exploited so in a time that muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as much as you want to think that he was up there floating in a cave our nabi took yes or no i'll take a d in the chat box his depressions his anxieties his social qualms and took it to the silence of his cave allahumma salli ala muhammad Thank you. Thank you so much. Asiya, I think that you see a lot of us want to romanticize. He went to the cave for, for, for meditation. He must have been floating and he only ate shrubbery. Nope. My Nabi Ali Salatu Wasalam had concerns of the Ummah, of the people. And here's another huge concern. He knew that those statues weren't, uh, uh, those idols weren't God. Those statues weren't God. So alayhi salatu wasalam, thank you friends. I know it's hard to, to think that our Nabi, before you called him Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he didn't have concerns. I know it's hard for you to use the word, but I'm setting up not a picture for you to see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but how many of us, 15, 10 minutes into the talk, are ready to step into the shoes are ready to sit there with the anxieties and difficulties and depressions of life, the nakedness, the lawlessness, and the what seems to be the loneliness. If you're ready to step into the shoes, sit in the sandals, sit in the place of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam with your subhanallah right now, I'm asking you, did my Nabi lean on the wall? Did my Nabi sleep? Did my Nabi wait? Okay, I guess if I wait here long enough, I'll get, I'll get guided, right? That's how this works. And then while you're contemplating this, after the story, fast forward 20 years later, did anybody go from the people of Mecca and sit in the caves? Really, friends, did anybody go and say, well, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam got Nubuwa, got met Jibril alayhi salam while going to the caves. Why don't I go do the next thing? Exactly, no. So was there something unique about this man living والسلام, in the middle of the desert in, during, in the Arabian Peninsula? Yes, nobody meditated. You don't have narrations after that. So I'm pulling you towards, he was settling down. He was grounding himself. And most of us do not recognize those 10 years before he said, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق. Before that dramatic, amazing experience that we've heard 58 times in Sunday school, how are you going to fast forward through the, the three, the trilogy, the prequels, the three, the 10 years that our Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam is going and coming from the mountain, friends. So in this moment, I ask you, do you mentally begin to ground yourself in this moment? Last week of 2020, are you ready, Ya Allah? In the 10, eight days that are left, five days that are left of this, this measurement of a year, oh Allah, begin to cleanse me, ground me. And I keep asking the same question. Was he leaning on the wall? He was focused on the one thing that 10,000 years of meditative practice has taught us. Conquer the breath and you will conquer the mind. Conquer the thoughts that cloud your the pool of your stillness, the pool of calmness. 
if any one of us was visited by an angel, we wouldn't just lose it right there. Forget about Ikra, we'd be on the floor having a seizure. I'm seeing things. I'm going crazy. Would you be in a state of clarity to not doubt yourself and say, but I have this limitation. So number one with me today, let me get a C if you are there to acknowledge 10 years, 10 X in the cave, years of trips back and forth. And you think every time something happened, can you imagine years three, four, and five, nothing happening, right? Maybe you'd be like, well, I got to five years, man. You're putting a notch on the wall. Come on. Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Nabi Yittawbah, Harisun alaykum, Najiyun, Taha Yasin. Our Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam did not know he was going to win. So I'm asking from you right now, did your Nabi know he was going to succeed? Did you know that Fath of Makkah would happen? Did you know Hudaybiyah? Did you know? Did you know that Madinatul Munawwara, Yathrib would change and the Barakah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I didn't. He didn't either. So you can toil that in your head as much as you want. But how many of us tend to distance ourselves from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Oh, he had it good. He was a prophet. Yeah, he prayed all night because, you know, he was a prophet. You don't think it was difficult to pray all night when there are five ayahs revealed? Come on, please throw me a bone here on this one. He's, he was just religious, so he just woke up all the time, right? He prayed all night, and that was just some extra genome inside of his sequencing. Be really pious and pray. Don't want to sleep. Didn't, isn't this the same person who said he loved Ithar, he loved the coolness of Salah, and he loved the beauty of, of female companionship? He loved women? I don't know which book you guys are living, but we're living in some idealized place that's not real. 10 years of sacrifice, 10 years of mental grounding, breathing, finding himself in a grounded, safe, hafidun, knowing that Allah was the grounder, the secure. Now you're in the cave with me on any given Friday, on any given Monday. We don't know. Does Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a 2-2 in the chat box? Not everyone has to, but really, if you never thought about it, did he know an angel was going to come that day? Did he get a memo like, yo, yo, get, get all ready, get all ready, go to the cave, like ready for what? Wahi, not at all. And we don't think about that at all. So my Nabi now is in 10 years into this practice. He's here. He's sitting on his mat, if you will, the crown of the floor. I'm giving you a Salah yoga analogy. He's sitting on his mat, not leaning on the wall, watching the rise and fall of his breath. And the the entire cave is illuminated. Help me here, friends. Is the presence of a light creature going to shine or are you going to feel? Do you feel the awe? Even if you're in the depth of meditation, do you feel the light of an angel creature? Oh, not just anyone, Jibreel, the angel creature who came to give wahi alayhi salatu wasalam. Now you're like, whoa. So that moment, maybe a millisecond could have been fear. Like, what's that sound? What's happening? But then can you imagine for a moment, friends, you all call, oh, that guy has so much nur. Can you imagine the presence of Jibreel alayhi salam, who has just brought wahi from Allah? Yes, overpowering, daunting, maybe a little scary. Is anyone else feeling full of love? Is anyone feeling a presence of someone who knows you already, but you've never met them? Is anyone feeling, I'll take the N in the chat box for filling in the empty molecules, the, the days and hours and years that he had sat there saying, but there has to be something more. There is something better. That's the end that I was looking for. That somebody, alayhi salatu was salam, is sitting there unfulfilled, not satisfied. And he's there like, look, the, the naked tawaf, the, the women being used, slavery, burying their kids, cheating in the scales. This is not the way it was supposed to be. Humankind is better than this. There are, these aren't idols are not God. There is a God, a creator of the heavens and the earth. There is a God of Abraham of, and of the men of the past, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now I want you to just for a moment, how many of you are there as the character in the cave? And right now Hafsa opens up that person's mic and I say, read. What's the first thing you're going to tell me? What's the first thing when I say, Asma, 
you go ahead and read right now. What's the first thing that you're going to feel when I'm like, okay, go help open up your mic and get started reading. Many of us, would you please fill in the line here? What did Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with 10 years of preparation and he's going to end up being a prophet? What did he say when he was asked? Thank you. Ma ana biqarin. I can't read. I can't do it. Limitations and logistics put those two L's down. He fell into, but I can't read. And the commandment was read. So he's like, but I can't. And then the squeeze came. Can you recognize that the squeeze pressed against his ribs? He could feel the ribs and he was like, but I can't. I cannot read. I cannot read. And on that second squeeze, he's being told, and it's this piercing sound that is overwhelming. It's beyond the decibels of a speaker. And he's saying, but I can't read. I can't. And it's that moment of pressure, that anxiety that you feel in the exact moment. And what was the third request? the first five ayahs of revelation came down. Could you feel the pressure all of a sudden go? Could you feel the anxiety go away? Because it was. Read it with me. Sharper raw. E, bounce your cough. Raw with your jaw. I want you to grab it and then sharp alif. Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaqa Khalaqa Al-Insana Min Alaqa Khalaqa Al-Insana Min Alaqa Iqra Wa Rabbuka Al-Akram How many people in this moment have experienced their own right now? It doesn't have to be conjured up if you feel it you feel it let me get a qr in the chat box if you just experienced the first half of a quran revolution that you are the caricature who is saying but i can't read i can't do it I'm, I'm a convert i don't know how to read i don't know what to do i'm not good enough i didn't pray fudger i don't i'm not i'm not pious i still have music in my life and the irony is we think we're going to be perfect before the Quran is going to heal us. You are the sick person standing outside of the hospital going, I'm, I'm almost better. I'm going to go inside <laughs> once I feel better. The Quran is light. Sin is darkness. The Quran will replace that darkness with light. Come on down. Thank you for standing with me. I appreciate you. I know half of you are staring like, did he think we were standing up? <laughs> Friends, you have begun. The real question is, was that the origin story of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's Quran experience? I'll take a one in the chat box if you agree. Was this the origin story of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Absolutely, friends. With your permission, let's take it down south again. And let's take a seat. Be comfortable. Barakallahu fikum. Sometimes it's important for us to be aware of the magnitude of a situation. And for me, that is one of the most powerful situations because he didn't, he didn't, he didn't know what else to say besides, but I can't read. He didn't know what else to say besides, uh, I don't read. And the irony was he repeated it. So unto ye friends, I, I don't want to go further than this one. So to, Uthman and Amin and Ferdosi and Ola, to everyone out there, truly, friends, there's only two answers to this. And the question, the decision is up to you. Where did your Quran origin story begin? A, fill in the blank. Tell us in the chat box. 
What was the first time you did? Or B, recognize today that you do not have a Quran origin story and let it be today. Let that origin story start on the 25th of December, 2020, in a year that felt like a desert. I looked into the desert the way Abraham did, alayhi salatu wasalam, when Abraham said, Rabbana wa ba'ath fihim O oh Allah, send to this place a Rasul, a messenger from amongst them. To me, it's a very powerful place, very powerful place for us to recognize that Abraham والسلام, looked into a barren desert, made dua knowing it would be accepted and not for thousands of years was his dua fully manifested. By the way, the miracle manifested by Abraham was what? Who is his dua? Who is the messenger to come? I love this part. The miracle manifested is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Asma'u and family, Mustafa family, I see a toddler. I got Arabic reading when I was a kid. Alif Bata booklet that my mom used to teach me. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about celebrating, attending masjid with my father, Uthman. Usama, barakallahu feekum, grandfather's house at Fajr while as a toddler. Allahu Akbaru Kabira. Friends, anyone more recently learn how to read, watch a video? As a, as a toddler in the village Quran school, Allahu, Allahu. Friends, now let me hear the other side. Let me see that triple seven in the chat box for those of you who are starting a Quranic origin story today. My Quran started the day I heard the story. The story of the cave that was 10 years in the making. That it was a man, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who did not know that an angel was going to show up and say, hey, you going to be a prophet? Nope. And here's the kicker. After he said, I can't. And then he repeated the words. Friends, what did he do? What did he do? Can anyone tell me? He ran to his spouse. He ran to his spouse. And there's an important lesson for every brother out there who feels vulnerable because his wife can read better than probably. Your wife probably reads better than you. Sorry, bro. That one might sting. Truth is truth. And you're like, oh, I'm man. Oh, rawr, rawr. oh. Right, you're, you're howling at the moon. I'm with you, my friend. We will howl together. But the reality, your woman needs you to read Quran, bro. She needs you to read Quran better than you've ever read in your life. So my real question is, being scared, vulnerable, where did he run? Where did he go? To his spouse. Ladies, I give you this one. If your spouse came in after he was out from a camping trip or somewhere he goes for meditation or just working out and said, hon, I think I'm crazy. Huh? Huh? How many of you ladies are rubbing your husband on the back going, I told you, honey, I've been telling you for 10 years. And now you finally got it, hon. Huh? Exactly. Exactly. So friends, work with me on this. Would you have the supportive nature to be able to support that man? Or you would say, oh, you had, a, you had an enlightening experience? Yeah, I'll hear about it. Take the garbage out. Did you get a chance to do that yet? No. So friends, and at the same time, brothers, he didn't run to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. He didn't go to the Kaaba. He didn't go to an elder. He went to the person he trusted and loved and felt most vulnerable with, his spouse. For those of you right now who are like, oh, I better go hide and learn to read Quran. My point is, join Quran Revolution as a family. Join a system, a learning place as a family. That to me means a lot more. And for, for no program or program, brothers, look up to your spouse. When you can look up to them, you can see only the good in them. And it will help you tremendously. Um, yes. We do. We need to get you married. Friends, let's go on to that next story now. Now, where does your Quranic journey begin? It could begin in one of a few places, but I will go with R-A-W, the raw, the base, recognition, assembly, and writing. Start from the very ground level. How many people want to drop a raw in the chat box and learn letters, letter recognition? Alif boy, two, three, jug, hollow, scratch. Alif ba, ta, ta, jim, ha, ha. There's that transition. You're like, what? Alif boy, 
two, three, Jug Hollow Scratch. The Zipper Alliance says raw. A Bumblebee says za. I have looked with my eyes, so I have seen. Let's go, friends. So I would love to give you more than that and say the Quran revolution answer is the how. Don't worry about logistics. How many people right now have prayed to God in Ramadan or Hajj? Oh, Allah, I want to learn Quran. Oh, Allah, you heard some cool lecture. You got all motivated. It's okay. 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 Hang on. So those of you who have been asking for a Quran learning system, are you worried about the how or do you need to double down on your why? And I request from you, I, I'm not here to promo Quran revolution. I, I, and I only got a text at the end. In my opinion, I prepared this talk not as a promo. Friends, this is real, right? Whether you sign up for a program that's working for thousands of people, that's besides my point. I, I genuinely want you to be able to say, the Quran, wherever you're going to start, you have to start from a place, R-A-W, for those of you who want to say, I don't care. I don't care to say I'm not able to read. I want to start from letters. Go right now. A massive action. There's no sign up for this tomorrow. Massive action right now. Go to YouTube, type in Wissam Sharif letters. Conquer your letters, R-A-W, in the chat box if you are putting a flag in the ground and you're making massive action to say, you know what? I'm beginning my Quranic journey now. For those of you who can read and know the recognition, the assembly, and the basic writing of words, abadan khalaqa yakhruju. For those of you who know it, let's take it up one level. Quran Revolution has a YouTube channel available to all of you. The irony is the free thing is used less than the thing that people pay for. I think it's funny. You've seen a Quran Revolution YouTube video. There's no commercial at the end. That's the irony. But that's for you to figure out. For those of you who know how to read and want to polish that recitation, check out Quran Revolution's YouTube channel. And lastly, for those of you who are ready to take a further step and a commitment, my only request, only request, today record yourself. Hafsa, Firdos, Usama, uh, Firdosi, Asia, friends, record yourself today. You know, they do those, uh, take a pic, take a selfie of yourself at the beginning of 2020. On the 25th of 2020, would you record yourself today? I sound horrible. You sound like, the, you sound like I can't read. You sound like I'm not sure of myself. How many people are willing to get out of the way and leave some room for the miracle? Let me get an M in the chat box. No, but I don't like the sound of my voice. Then fix it. We go sit there all. I don't like my cooking, so I will never eat again. I, I, I don't know. Y'all are wilding. I got, I got time for this. It's Friday. So I'm going to say one more reason, if I may truly. The story of the cave comes back for many reasons, and it, uh, it establishes the fact that our Nabi experienced feelings and said he couldn't. But with Sister Hafsa's permission, and I'll, I'll close out in two minutes, I'm going to answer my why today. My why. You know why? Two Mondays ago, my dad passed away. And in his passing, I felt more grief than I've ever felt in my life. I've never experienced grief like that. I thought the loss of your first love, nah, piece of cake. Loss of a parent, it's the worst grief I ever felt in my life. And I had a choice, fall apart, cancel all my Quran classes and memorization and reading students and Juma, not cancel Juma, but khutbah. And then I thought, what's my why? My why is because there's not a day of my life that I lived with my father that I didn't hear him reading Quran after Fajr. Was it perfect? Was it a shaykhi reading? Nope. Don't think my dad could spell tajweed. Don't care. I know for a fact that I study Quran and I teach it because I'm good at it. Alhamdulillah. I'm also very humble. I teach it because my dad taught. My dad taught mathematics. And his brothers taught English and other sciences. And my grandfather taught. And the uncles taught. And the great uncles taught. I remember my dad saying, we all teach. The teaching will come easy. I will give you the best thing to teach. My why is because my dad's just opened a uh, retirement account. 
after he died, everything I do goes in that account. A little piece, a little acorns, if you will. I request that you all don't wait for the day that you have to bury a parent or, you know, like some tragic thing happens because I got to be real with you. If I didn't have a lot, I'd be a hot mess right now. Like no joke. There's no joke at all. So I just want to put that down on your plate. Why? What's your why? How? Eh. Come on, guys, for real. Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ that the Quran was going to be made easy for anyone who wanted to memorize it. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa after revelation, got a little concerned about keeping it all in his head. What did God say from Surah 75? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't move your tongue quickly. Oh, I, I won't get it. I won't memorize it. Don't worry about the how. It is jo God's job to gather the Quran inside you. If people are willing to get out of the way, I want you to say it out loud. I'm ready to get out of my own way, whether that be finance or uh, I don't like to study with those Al Maghrib people. Okay, whatever floats your boat, hon. But let's not make any regrets. Let's not make any regrets. So as I buried a the most beloved person, my parent, I really did think. I was like, either you fall apart, you die in pain, or you live in the memory of your father. I choose to do that. I choose to live. A sense of salam upon you, around you, and may salam emanate in all things that you do. I suppose that the right thing to do here is to tell you a little bit about Quran Revolution. You can go to QuranRevolution.com. It's not only an app. An app is one-fifth of the program. It's a community that's going to give you more Quran programs, read-along communities, one uh, office hours, uh, uh, levels, ba classes based on your levels, Quran reading circles, hangouts, Eid parties. You'll, there'll be more things than you can do. There's no way you could buy Quran Revolution, sign up, become a student, and do everything. The party's going on all the time. It is your choice to then say, how am I going to make this all work for me? If I have any QR students in the chat box, um, please let me know. Friends, this is how it works. Once you sign up, you'll be given an assessment. That assessment is five questions, each one progressively harder. Kara, good to see you, friends. Sabine, Sabina, Bark, Laufikum, friends. I want to talk to you in a moment. You sign up, you take an assessment, you get placed in level one, two, or three. Level one, you're learning to read and polishing that reading, even if you knew how to read it as a child, but you need a good refresher, level one, raw. Level two, P-A-R, bringing your reading up to par. The phonetics, the accents, the rhythm of the Quran is in level two. In level three, we work on flow, and in the newest level four, we work on art, advanced reading techniques. These classes, levels, meet every week for one class that goes over all the content. Each level, level one, two, and three, meets twice a week. So if you miss one live class, you can come to the other. Brother, can I come to both? Yeah, I guess, but I'm going to be teaching the same thing in both. And then you take your live class then you can watch your videos on your app. You can watch your follow-up on your app. Then you can pick up your app. And I think this is a pretty cool thing. And then it says, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, uh, uh, Asiya, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, Ola, uh, uh, Akram and family, As-salamu alaykum. This is your lesson today. And then you press record and then you read your lesson in, um, uh, in, uh, in this. Oh, there's no bait and switch here, guys. There's no bait and switch. Um, I teach all of my classes, but you, uh, mark your words for Dosi. In a little while, you're going to meet the female TAs and you guys are going to throw me to the side, right? Uh, Sister Jasmine out there, salams to you. Uh, Sheikha Jasmine, uh, Ustada Tasneem, Sheikh Abdurrahman, Sheikh Umar, Bark Laufikum to all of you out there, Ustad Musa and uh, uh, Ustad Adib. Um, we have a great cast back here, but I, I understand sometimes the, the question can be like, is, is he just going to be the face on the front? Do I look like I'm going to be the face on the front? 
friends, I love doing this. You can't get me away from my classes. They, 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 they offer me cookies to come and do these live sessions. And man, I, I come. So I'm going to turn it over to my friend here, Bark Law Fikum. You do live sessions. You recite into your recording. You have QRCs where we don't study a specific topic. We just read Quran. I think it's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much, Hafsa, for all you do on a daily basis, for your energy, for keeping the show going. A lot of people don't know what it takes to keep uh, to keep the record spinning. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you entertainment in paradise. May you receive entertainment in paradise. Barak mm-hmm. Laufikum, friends, have a great evening, afternoon. This wasn't a Quran revolution promo. You know that this was about your Quran origin story. You want to know about QR? Go to QuranRevolution.com. Uh, we got a couple of thousand students to Barak Allah, so I'm not worried about people not benefiting. My concern is what chatter is going on in your head about why you can't do it. Go be the best you in 2021. Barak law if your If your dua being answered doesn't scare you, you ain't making dua big enough, honey. If your dua answered, like what? I can memorize the whole Quran. If your dua, Wissam will have a healing clinic where people can bring their cancers and greatest diseases, terminal patients can come. Yeah, that scares me a little bit. I want that. Allah mami. Go be as beautiful as you. The beauty that you seek, may you become it. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Jazakumullah khair, Imam Wassam. I'm not going to keep you for too long. There's so many quotable parts of that that talk. And honestly, ent- entertainment, the Jannah, mashallah, I can't imagine it being so much better than, than this entertainment right here. Jazakumullah khair for your time. Um, and we'll let you run. And inshallah, we'll have a, a final little wrap up here. So stick around with me, everyone, inshallah. But uh, Jazakumullah khair for that beautiful, beautiful uh, story and that uh, interactive session. <laughs> Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. And for those of you, I know there were so many comments and questions coming in uh, that I couldn't keep up with. Mashallah, I'm trying to read through as many of them as possible, but Alhamdulillah, it's been a blessing uh, to end off on such a beautiful and interactive session. I was trying to keep my cat at bay. She got so excited when Imam Musam started reciting, Alhamdulillah. Um, but I do hope that you genuinely, genuinely take his advice and make 2021 the year of the Quran. I know there's been so many things that have been happening in 2020 that we haven't had a control over. We can't control our external kind of circumstances in our environment. What we can control what we can change is what's happening within ourselves and the best way to change is to change in a way that brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to learn about his religion to learn about his, the stories of his of his religion to learn about his book and to recite it beautifully all the things that were holding you back and that were uh, you know you know making you anxious and stressed and whatnot maybe making you doubt yourself when it came to your confidence in learning the deen and and reciting into and to learning the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I want you guys to put that all aside and take advantage. We did actually link the Quran Revolution link, uh, and I think it's in, in the chats as well on Facebook and YouTube, but it's definitely in the description of all the sessions that are going on right now. So please make sure that you take full advantage. Check it out right now. Don't wait a full week. Sorry, cat hair everywhere. <laughs> Don't wait the full week. It's ex- the, the semester right now is closing soon. It's closing in a week, uh, but Shaitan can work his magic really, really quickly. It takes a week is a lot of time for him. So make sure you take that initiative, mashallah. You guys have been joining in as families and, and taking such good steps together uh, and getting in inspired in all these different uh, elements, different stages of your lives, mashallah, make sure that you get inspired together and to undertake this journey together as a family through QuranRevolution.org, inshallah. Again, link to the bio. And mashallah, it's amazing to see so many lovely QR students. I saw one QRTA, mashallah, sticking in there as well. May Allah reward you all for investing in your journey of learning the Quran. And again, Kitty is really trying to get my attention right now, alhamdulillah. To wrap up, uh, and I hope that Jazakallah Khair, those of you who stuck around to the end, is, you know, subhanAllah, it's been such a blessing to have all these exciting projects going on, taking care of all aspects of our faith, our ummah, our children, ourselves when it comes to our recitation and our knowledge of the deen. Alhamdulillah. And this, I know it's been short and sweet, this live series. Uh, I want you guys to make sure that you do subscribe to the Maghrib YouTube channel and join the Maghrib Family First Facebook group. Uh, we do a lot of updates. And of course, Faith Essentials, you guys are VIPs anyway, so you know everything that's going on. Alhamdulillah. Uh, make sure you keep up because there's going to be new live sessions. There's going to be other things that you may miss out on throughout the course of the year. And of course, we have our famous now uh, Ramadan 360 program coming up, inshallah, when Ramadan comes back to us again. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I want to thank the instructors. They put their heart and their soul and their energy, and they come and they, 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 they just inspire the entire uh, ummah watching them. While I know, mashallah, they have so much going on in their own lives and their own plates. So I do hope that you guys genuinely, genuinely, genuinely keep them in your eye. 
guys, after this session is over or while you're listening to me right now, just make a good strong thought for all of our instructors who just come in and they inspire us at short notice at, with very little time working to get as many gems, as much benefit in there as humanly possible for you all. May Allah reward them immensely. We definitely can't compensate them for the amount of good that they do it on our end. And inshallah, may Allah reward them uh, far more than we can possibly thank them even. Uh, finally, of course, we have our families that have been joining in together. May Allah reward you all. Uh, I know it's been tough for some of you waking up in the middle of the night, early in the morning, or just doing something so consistently. But I'm so happy to see uh, all these familiar names coming through day after day after day, sticking around, coming through in the middle of the session, waiting till the end, watching the recordings, and the lovely, lovely, lovely young ones. Now, again, I can't memorize all of your names, mashallah. There's Omar, Fatima, Nasreen, Muhammad Ali, Yahya, Mudassir, Abu Bakr, Iman, and there was hundreds more that I just, I could be here all day if I were to read them all out, mashallah. You guys honestly, honestly made this the best experience ever. It was one of the most fun live experiences that I've ever had as a host, having all these amazing young uh, commenters, alhamdulillah, in the chat, completely making me laugh and smile and making my evenings. Uh, and I hope that you guys as well enjoyed that aspect of the experience as well. Uh, and that's that's a wrap. Now, alhamdulillah, for Amalgrib's family first, I hope that you guys remember to take initiative on the things that you guys have heard about. Check Check out amalgrip.org for all of the exciting courses with these exciting instructors that you have had a chance to benefit from this week. Check out Quran Revolution immediately because that's very time sensitive. That's going to be closing very soon. Uh, and make sure you take that, undertake that Quran journey with yourselves and your families. And of course, check out uh, amalgrip.org slash kids to support the amazing campaign that's that's been kind of born out of this experience. May Allah reward you all for sticking around this long and through this spiel as well. And I look forward to seeing you all happy and healthy and safe inshallah in 2021 with all the exciting things that Amalgam Institute has coming for you. Take care, stay safe until then. And finally, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone.